Welcome to Food for Thought. My name is Colleen Patrick Goudreau from Compassionate Cooks, which I founded to empower people to make informed food choices and to debunk myths about vegetarianism and animal rights. I do this through cooking classes, an online cookbook, articles and essays, this podcast, and a cooking DVD I produced last year. You can learn more about who we are and what we do by visiting our website, CompassionateCooks.com. Thank you again for all the emails and the comments I've been reading on iTunes. Your response to this podcast means so much to me. So please keep listening and encourage others to do the same. And please subscribe. I read every one of your emails. So please keep them coming. I hear from many of you telling me that you had no idea about many of the issues about which I speak. And it means so much to me. It's exactly why I do this, and it gives me a tremendous amount of hope to hear from all of you. So if you'd like to drop me a line, you can do so at podcast at compassionatecooks.com. And feel free to offer suggestions for future shows as well. Also, the popularity of the podcast and my commitment to doing them indefinitely means that I have inherent production costs. In fact, I was ready to record today's podcast a week ago, but was experiencing technical difficulties. So if you appreciate what you're hearing and are able to support the podcast at all, you can do so on our website. Just visit CompassionateCooks.com and click on the Support Podcast button. Also, please tell others about the podcast and add a link to your website if you like what you hear. This particular podcast is possible because of the generous support of Charlie and Vicki Talbert. So thank you both so very much. The topic of humane meat, humane animal products, has come up a lot on this show and will continue to come up because of its popularity in the media and public consciousness. As you may already know, this is one of my hot button issues, and I'd like to base today's show on an article I wrote for Satya magazine. Now, you can read my article or listen to the podcast called From Cradle to Grave, The Facts Behind Humane Eating on my website. That was their September issue. Today's podcast is based on my article in their October issue called Dishing Out the Bull, The Rise of the Excusitarians. And by the way, Satya Magazine is a powerful magazine that focuses on the connections between all social justice issues, animal rights, and vegetarianism. You can visit their website at satya, S-A-T-Y-A, mag.com, satyamag.com. This particular article speaks to some of the more romantic excuses I hear for continuing to eat meat. The prevalence of these excuses reminds me of the 19th century Danish fairy tale written by Hans Christian Andersen, The Emperor's New Clothes, or The Emperor Has No Clothes. I read this tale at the end of the podcast just for fun, but in summary, it's basically a fable or a morality tale whose message is, just because everyone else believes something is true doesn't mean it is. And it takes the voice of innocence, of truth, in the form of a little child to pierce the illusion and lift the veil from everyone's eyes. It reminds me so much of the ways people romanticize eating animals and everyone unquestioningly agreeing with them. So I'm here to pierce the illusion. Now, I've heard every excuse in the book for eating animals, but I have yet to hear a convincing reason. It's a pretty simple equation. Since humans don't need to consume animals to survive, killing them simply to satisfy our taste buds amounts to senseless slaughter. And let's face it, this is what it comes down to. It comes down to taste, not a concern for the animals. A survey by Food Marketing Institute and the American Meat Institute distilled that more shoppers are buying organic and quote-unquote humanely raised meat because of the quote superior taste. Our eating habits and appetites have very deep roots and we tend to prefer convenience over conscience. With a determination that belies an irrational attachment to animal flesh and secretions, otherwise sensible and sensitive people spend endless amounts of time and energy concocting outrageous excuses to justify this unnecessary habit. Using lyrical and exalted language, they extol the virtues of tradition, glorify the need to conserve heritage breeds, and wax poetic about our evolutionary heritage. With humane meat gaining popularity, non-vegetarians have completely co-opted the ethical argument. They're winning. But it's not the vegetarians who are losing. It's the animals. I live in the capital of quote-unquote, sustainable food, where Alice Waters, who founded Chez Panisse, and Michael Pollan have practically been canonized. 
and ethical ranchers are idolized. Though I agree with the need to support local farmers and educate the public about the corporate takeover of our food supply, I worry sometimes that the proponents of the sustainable humane meat philosophy are going to hurt themselves patting each other on the back. Despite the fact that they're responsible for the needless killing of animals who, if given the choice, would choose to live, they're lauded for their ethical eating. And I wonder if it's considered ethical to eat the bodies of animals who are harmed a little less before their throats are slit, who are prayed over before they're dismembered. Isn't it still more ethical not to slit their throats at all? Affixed with meaningless labels that make it seem as if the animals sacrificed themselves for the pleasure of humans, the holy triumvirate of meat, dairy, and eggs remains the sacred foundation of the human diet, regarded as more of a birthright than a privilege. The marketing that surrounds these products suggests that not eating meat is downright un-American, and this is echoed by the mainstream public as well as by progressives. One popular environmental magazine, I think it's called Grist, self-righteously suggested that vegans fast on Thanksgiving since vegans are merely, quote, mimicking dominant culture, unquote, by serving, quote, an atrocious and non-local tofu log. The arrogance of that statement makes my skin crawl. Those who argue that we should eat meat because it's traditional seem to imply that the meat eater's desires or traditions, culture or taste buds are superior to anything or anyone else. Just because we've always done something doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. Culture and tradition are not excuses for cruelty. Perhaps the most audacious example of how the humane meat proponents have so adeptly usurped the ethics of eating is in the case of, quote, heritage breed animals. Have you heard of this? The self-congratulatory founders and followers of Slow Food USA and Heritage Foods USA commend themselves for saving these, quote, delicious American treasures from the brink of extinction and declare, and I am not making this up, that we must eat them to save them. The idea is that by creating a marketplace for these dead animals, they are, in effect, saving their lives. That kind of doublespeak would make George Orwell proud. In one of his articles, Michael Pollan boasts how he and his Thanksgiving guests feasting on a heritage breed turkey were, quote, in some small way contributing to its survival. I wonder how so intelligent a man can't detect the absurdity of such a statement. I state the obvious when I say that if they really cared about those breeds, there are ways to protect them without killing and eating them. And that's not to say they don't care. They do care. They really do. And they care about how the animals taste. They use sensual, lyrical language to describe it. They talk about the complex, succulent flavors that echo a bygone error. The most amazing thing I ever read was in the New York Times dining section at Easter time a couple years ago. It was titled, A Little Lamb Eats Ivy and Clover and Fennel and Garlic, which explains why it tastes so good. The writer's use of lyrical language to describe the taste of one-month-old lambs was, quite frankly, perverse. She writes, and I'm not making this up either, quote, The delicate herbaceousness of the meat is like an edible postcard from the animal's hometown. I've also heard humane meat consumers attribute the superior taste of the steaks to the fact that the ranchers say a prayer for each cow before they slaughter it. The romanticizing of something so ugly belies a desperate attempt to deny what's true. There's nothing beautiful about slaughter. One of the most ludicrous justifications I've heard for eating animals is that we did them a favor by domesticating them, having created a, quote, mutual agreement that protects animals from their natural predators and grants humans the gift of the animal's flesh and secretions in return. It's really a nice thought to believe that the animals who we've bred to kill somehow signed this social contract with us, offering to us their dismembered body parts and reproductive secretions in exchange for protection from the big bad predators. However, it's an arrogantly anthropocentric 
perspective that echoes the sentiments of slave masters until we remove the cages and the fences the tethers and the barbed wire i am apt to believe that the animals were not consulted when this mutual agreement was created related to this argument is the one that declares that early humans ate animals in order to justify us eating them now you've heard this well we always ate animals humans always ate animals so that's why we should eat animals now Michael Pollan even charges vegetarians with turning their backs on their evolutionary heritage on the grounds that eating meat helped us make us what we are, totally disregarding the fact that up until very recently, meat was generally used as a condiment and considered a luxury. By eschewing meat, he says unabashedly, we are sacrificing a part of our identity. I'm not sure what Michael Pollan is suggesting. It sounds like he's suggesting that we look to Darwinian evolution as a moral system by which to justify our actions. In no other aspect of our lives do we use evolution to justify our behavior. So why should this be the exception? We have the ability and responsibility to make moral and rational decisions, not abdicate our ethics to a mindless and amoral process. Arguments such as these deny every aspect of what makes us rational, compassionate, and moral creatures. We're not forced to obey the dictates of evolution, just as we don't obey them when we write novels, or build flying machines, or splice genes. Darwin's theory is not a substitute for morality, except when we want to justify eating animals. There is perhaps no other lifestyle habit we spend so much time defending. I believe that every excuse we make is an attempt to absolve ourselves from our participation in the gratuitous exploitation, mutilation, and death of non-human animals. If we have to disguise, rationalize, romanticize, and ritualize eating animals to such a degree that we're no longer living in reality or truth, then perhaps we're not comfortable with it at all. Adopting a vegan diet is the best choice I've ever made, and I've never had to offer any excuses for it. That's just one of the many liberating byproducts of making this choice. One of the reasons Michael Pollan and other excusitarians get away with espousing these lame excuses that sound like they have substance is because nobody's challenging them. Just as in Hans Christian Andersen's fairy tale, nobody wants to appear different, so everyone agrees. Yes, it's true. The animals, they're in mutual agreement with us. Yes, we're at the top of the food chain. Yes, we'd be sacrificing a part of our identity. If you've ever echoed any of these excuses, I encourage you to deconstruct them yourself and ask yourself if you really buy them and if they're really good enough for you to compromise your values over or if they're really a reflection of your values. If you're someone who hears these excuses by the media or individuals, friends, family, or coworkers, I urge you to find your voice and speak on behalf of those who have no voice. Be the little child in Anderson's story who courageously and honestly asserts that the emperor has no clothes. Their excuses have no legs. They have nothing to stand on, but until we pierce that veil, the animals will continue to lose. If you'd like to keep listening, I've recorded a reading of Anderson's tale, just in case you've forgotten it all these years. And if you'd like to stop here, this is Colleen from Compassionate Cooks. Thank you very much for listening. The Emperor's New Clothes by Hans Christian Anderson. Many years ago, there was an emperor so exceedingly fond of new clothes that he spent all his money on being well-dressed. He cared nothing about reviewing his soldiers, going to the theater, or going for a ride in his carriage, except to show off his new clothes. He had a coat for every hour of the day, and instead of saying, as one might, about any other ruler, the kings in council, here they always said, the emperors in his dressing room. In the great city where he lived, life was always gay. Every day many strangers came to town, and among them one day came two swindlers. They let it be known they were weavers, and they said they could weave the most magnificent fabrics imaginable. Not only were their colors and patterns uncommonly fine, but clothes made of this cloth had a wonderful way of becoming invisible to anyone who was unfit for his office, or who was unusually stupid. Those would be just the clothes for me, thought the emperor. If I wore them, I would be able to discover which men in my empire were unfit for their posts, and I could tell the wise men from the fools, yes, I certainly must get some of the stuff woven for me right away. 
he paid the two swindlers a large sum of money to start work at once. They set up two looms and pretended to weave, though there was nothing on the looms. All the finest thread which they demanded went into their traveling bags, while they worked the empty looms far into the night. I'd like to know how those weavers are getting on with the cloth, the emperor thought, but he felt slightly uncomfortable when he remembered that those who were unfit for their position would not be able to see the fabric. It couldn't have been that he doubted himself, yet he thought he'd rather send someone else to see how things were going. The whole town knew about the cloth's peculiar power at this point, and all were impatient to find out how stupid their neighbors were. I'll send my honest old minister to the weavers, the emperor decided. He'll be the best one to tell me how the material looks, for he's a sensible man, and no one does his duty better. So the honest old minister went to the room where the two swindlers sat working away at their empty looms. Heaven help me, he thought, as his eyes flew wide open. I can't see anything at all. But he did not say so. Both the swindlers begged him to be so kind as to come near to approve the excellent pattern, the beautiful colors. They pointed to the empty looms, and the poor old minister stared as hard as he dared. He couldn't see anything, because there was nothing to see. Heaven have mercy, he thought. Can it be that I am a fool? I'd have never guessed it, and not a soul must know. Am I unfit to be the minister? It would never do to let on that I can't see the cloth. "'Don't hesitate to tell us what you think of it,' said one of the weavers. "'Oh, it's beautiful, it's enchanting,' the old minister peered through his spectacles. "'Such a pattern, what colors! "'I'll be sure to tell the emperor how delighted I am with it.' "'We're pleased to hear that,' the swindler said. "'They proceeded to name all the colors and to explain the intricate pattern. "'The old minister paid the closest attention so that he could tell it all to the emperor. "'And so he did.' The swindlers at once asked for more money, more gold thread to get on with the weaving, but it all went into their pockets. Not a thread went into the looms, though they worked at their weaving as hard as ever. The emperor presently sent another trustworthy official to see how the work progressed and how soon it would be ready. The same thing happened to him that happened to the minister. He looked and he looked, but as there was nothing to see in the looms, he couldn't see anything. "'Isn't it a beautiful piece of goods?' the swindlers asked him as they displayed and described their imaginary pattern. "'I know I'm not stupid,' the man thought. "'So it must be that I am unworthy of my good office. That's strange. I mustn't let anyone find out, though. So he praised the material he did not see. He declared he was delighted with the beautiful colors and the exquisite pattern. To the emperor, he said, it held me spellbound.' All the town was talking of this splendid cloth, and the emperor wanted to see it for himself while it was still in the looms. Attended by a band of chosen men, among whom were his two old trusted officials, the ones who had been to the weavers, he set out to see the two swindlers. He found them weaving with might and main, but without a thread in their looms. Magnificent, said the two officials, already duped. Just look, your majesty, what colors, what a design! They pointed to the empty looms, each supposing that the others could see the stuff. What's this? thought the emperor. I can't see anything. This is terrible. Am I a fool? Am I unfit to be the emperor? What a thing to happen to me of all people. Oh, it's very pretty, he said. It has my highest approval. And he nodded approbation at the empty loom. Nothing could make him say that he couldn't see anything. His whole retinue stared and stared. One saw no more than another. But they all joined the emperor in exclaiming, Oh, it's very pretty. And they advised him to wear clothes made of this wonderful cloth, especially for the great procession he was soon to lead. Magnificent, excellent, unsurpassed were bandied from mouth to mouth, and everyone did his best to seem well pleased. The emperor gave each of the swindlers a cross to wear in his buttonhole and the title of Sir Weaver. Before the procession, the swindlers sat up all night and burned more than six candles to show how busy they were finishing the emperor's new clothes. They pretended to take cloth off the loom. They made cuts in the air with huge scissors, and at last they said, Now the emperor's new clothes are ready for him. Then the emperor himself came with his noblest noblemen, and the swindlers each raised an arm as if they were holding something. They said, These are the trousers, here's the coat, and this is the mantle, naming each garment. All of them are as light as a spider web. One would almost think he had nothing on, but that's what makes them so fine. Exactly, all the noblemen agreed, though they could see nothing, for there was nothing to see. 
"'If your imperial majesty will condescend to take your clothes off,' said the swindlers, "'we will help you on with your new ones here in front of the long mirror.' The emperor undressed, and the swindlers pretended to put his new clothes on him, one garment after another. They took him around the waist and seemed to be fastening something. That was his train. As the emperor turned round and round before the looking-glass, "'How well your majesty's new clothes look! Aren't they becoming?' he heard on all sides. "'That pattern so perfect, those colors so suitable. It's a magnificent outfit.' Then the minister of public processions announced, "'Your majesty's canopy is waiting outside.' "'Well, I'm supposed to be ready,' the emperor said, and turned again for one last look in the mirror. "'It is a remarkable fit, isn't it?' He seemed to regard his costume with the greatest interest. The noblemen who were to carry his train stooped low and reached for the floor as if they were picking up his mantle. Then they pretended to lift and hold it high. They didn't dare admit they had nothing to hold. So off went the emperor in procession under his splendid canopy. Everyone in the streets and the window said, Oh, how fine are the emperor's new clothes! Don't they fit him to perfection and see his long train? Nobody would confess that he couldn't see anything, for that would prove him either unfit for his position or a fool. No costume the emperor had worn before was ever such a complete success. But he hasn't got anything on! A little child said, "'Did you ever hear such innocent prattle?' said its father. And one person whispered to another what the child had said, "'He hasn't anything on. A child says he hasn't anything on. But he hasn't got anything on,' the whole town cried out at last. The emperor shivered, for he suspected they were right, but he thought, "'This procession has got to go on.' So he walked more proudly than ever, as his noblemen held high the train." that wasn't there at all. Well, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the story. And if it sounds familiar, speak up. Take care.